Hi, my name is David Proden. I'm the Director of Student Services for the DeForest Area School District. And with me I have Greg Vandahey, an 8th grade social studies teacher at DeForest Area Middle School. Uh, last year, Greg and his wife Anna went to China, and today we're going to talk about those experiences, specific as they relate to inclusion of students with disabilities. So Greg, thanks for uh, being here today. You're welcome. Good to be here. Um, I do have uh, some questions for you. Could you give us an overview of your year working in the Chinese uh, educational system? Okay. Um, I spent a, a year um, working in an international elementary school. It was a private school, and it was the first year of that school, so getting, getting it started from the ground up. Uh, prior to that, I made a visit to China, and um, as our school was getting started, uh, visited many schools just to get a good idea of how Chinese schools function. Our goal was to be a little bit different in that we were an international school, so we were going to um, have a lot of the same ideas that the Chinese schools use, but half the time we were going to try to have a Western influence because half of our day would be taught in English. So I spent a lot of time um, in many schools, uh, visiting nearly 40 schools um, during the time that I was in, in China, both public and private. Uh, we were a private school, but I did spend quite a bit of time uh, touring public schools as well. The, um, the schools in China wasn't untypical for them to have very large class sizes. Many of the public schools had 60 to 70 students in a class. Wow. And um, one thing I found out very early on, um, as far as the teacher training and teachers being prepared to become teachers, basically there was not a whole lot of training. Um, most of them, the Chinese teachers had the college education uh, from a four-year college or a lot of times in China it's a three-year stint, but they did not uh, really have specific courses in teaching. So we had teachers um, who would just come in and maybe they had a music background okay. and then they would they would try to learn to become teachers from from the veteran teachers who were already teaching. So quite different from, from what we have here. So, in general, the practice in China is to not serve students with disabilities in the public schools. And could you observe, you mentioned you went to 40 schools. Uh, could you kind of give us an overview of um, students with disabilities, if, why, if they're not served in schools, why is that? Or if they are, how does that look? Or um, just that kind of whole, maybe the cultural mm -hmm. perspective on that? Yeah, um, I'm not, you know, I'm not sure the exact reason if I can pinpoint that, but I, I would say that um, part of it reminded me of um, when you talk about special education in the United States and you go back 50 years or you talk, okay. talk about before we had some special education laws um, in place, things were quite different here also. And I would say it's similar to that. It's not that the Chinese are, are not compassionate. They're very compassionate um, culture. It, it's more or less, I think, that they haven't gotten to the point yet where um, perhaps, perhaps they see the benefit to students with disabilities being included in, in the regular classroom. Uh, I did not see students that, uh, with, with any physical disabilities. I didn't get to know the students in the other schools well enough to know if there were any other uh, special learning needs that the students have, but I, I do know that there are no programs in place, there's no extra funding. There's no um, specific roles in the classroom for teachers, such as uh, uh, your special ed, or they, they just they don't have special ed at all. So, so what happens? A uh, student then stays home with the parent, typically, or is there some kind of institutional location I, that a student with um, a Down syndrome or, or or somewhere else the, they'd go? The uh, student, um, I didn't see students with Down syndrome, but my understanding is that they would be they would be taught at home. A lot of times they would stay with a grandparent while the parents worked. And the um, students, a student, for instance, if they, if they had um, some type of a, a disability that maybe isn't apparent by, by visually looking at that student, okay. they, they would be just placed in the school and they would probably do the best they could. Physical disabilities, um, I'll talk about a student with cerebral palsy a little bit later, would, would just be placed in a home setting and that student would, would be um, taught by uh, most likely in 
China, it would be the grandparents that would probably take care of that, that child during the day. I'm going to ask you a little bit more about why your perception on, um, it seems disabilities aren't, aren't in the forefront, aren't discussed a lot in China. At this point, uh, I did, you did indicate that you think um, China is moving in that direction, kind of where the United States was maybe 50 years ago, and um, bringing, starting to bring disabilities a little more into the light of day. But is there a social uh, stigma if you have a child with a disability? Um, it, is it, uh, I guess I, I need to know a little bit more from you, of, um, is, is it a situation where parents or the community feels um, embarrassed or I, I'm trying to understand this a little bit better. Yeah, um, just, just from my experiences with, there's, there's one example of a government official, government official that we worked with and um, he, he had a student that uh, had, had some struggles in school and um, from my times that I spent with his his child, actually his own child, um, I suspected there may have been some autism, um, and there's no such thing in China as autism. And one of the um, teachers in our school had brought up the fact that there there was something she noticed about this student. Maybe doesn't look, doesn't make the eye contact and things with with people when they when they when this child talks to people, looks down at the floor. And um, I mentioned, you know, possibly autism is what sure. I suspected. I'm not an expert on that, but I, it, it was, seemed like that was probably the case. And it, it, she, they had had a conversation about whether they should mention it to him that maybe there's some things that we could do to help them. But then most of the Chinese said that that probably wouldn't be a very wise thing to do because you're basically telling him that his child is not um, so-called normal or um, it would be an embarrassment to the family. Okay to know that, that uh, your child, I think part of it too might be like a spiritual thing too because they they would believe that if their child was born different or is, is got, has a special need, is not uh, quote normal, then um, maybe that they were, that would, there's a reason that they were given a child that has those needs. I okay. think that's part of it. Well, you mentioned before uh, that you had a story to share about a young man that you um, came to your school, I believe, with cerebral palsy, and mm -hmm. I think that had a very positive uh, outcome, too. Can you tell us about that, uh, young man? Yeah, uh, I mean, I think, you know, as far as the accomplishments of getting the school started, I, I personally, this is probably um, the, the story that is, is t it's touching to me because it, it probably was the best accomplishment that I made the whole year in China. Uh, we had a um, we had a Chinese principal also in our school, and she had mentioned that there's a there's a parents coming with their child, and um, this was through a translator because she spoke a little English, and I don't I don't speak Chinese. And she, um, through the translator, it was indicated to me that the child was crippled, is how that word was translated. And I kind of asked um, what kind of handicap, like physical handicap, with legs. They said legs do not work. And so um, a little bit later, the child, <clears throat> the child came walking in with his parents, and his mother was kind of holding on to his arm. And it, it was pretty obvious to me that it was cerebral palsy when, when the child came. And as we talked, they wanted their, their child to be enrolled in our school. And one reason for that is he had a fascination with the English language, and he wanted to learn English, and we were teaching 50% English. And so they brought the child into the school, and um, I, uh, I was very impressed with, he was an eight, eight year old boy and very impressed with his English speaking ability because especially where we were in Komeng, um, unless the students had specific English training or were in a school, they, their English was not, you know, they, they knew a few words, but he was learning English any way he could, American movies and so on, and he was able to communicate quite well. He, um, he, he was able to walk on his own uh, very slowly. Most of the time he had someone helping him. He had no walker or any other equipment um, that was basically unknown to them. So I, I wasn't 100% sure that it was cerebral palsy, but that that's seemed to be what it was for me. So I had asked you through a translator uh, what his diagnosis was, and uh, they said there really was none. Uh, the only thing that they know is the doctor told them when he was born 
that he wasn't he did not get enough uh, air he did not get enough oxygen uh, either prior to the birth or during the birth and I think that actually probably goes along with the cerebral palsy so um, we talked with the parents and then we had a little meeting and the parents sat out and drank tea and the Chinese teachers and even the Chinese principal said um, he's a nice little boy and we, I said yeah he's got a great sense of humor and we talked a little bit about that and so they saw that side of this this um, this child that that kind of touched me and then they said yeah we won't he can't um, he can't go to school here though and I was kind of taken back and shocked by that and I, I wondered why um, they felt that way and then it was explained to me well they said he can't go up the steps or they, he, he wouldn't be able to do that this and that and I said well do you think he he would be able to learn because he's, he's a bright little boy sure. and uh, you know there's a lot of things he can do that he doesn't need his legs for and we can help him up the steps and started talking to them about it one of the one of the teachers asked uh, what would you do in America with with a boy if, if he was in your school in Wisconsin where you teach and his parents came in and then I kind of explained to them how the public school system works also and um, that we have programs in place and um, that we would probably have a one-on-one -on -one aid with him so I had su suggested that we, yes we can take this ch this child into our school um, we should provide that provide him a one-on-one -on -one aid you know, that will work with him and that will help him can also help the other students in the class and um, so after quite a long conversation um, they said okay we trust that you can get this to work and I said I'll do everything that I can my, he would be with my, my wife, Anna, for half the day. Um, she has a special ed background also. Um, her minor and her undergrad was, so she, she has a special place in, in her heart for helping students of all disabilities. So she, um, she was very welcoming, and um, we, we took him in. The, when the parents were notified and we told them, yes, we will, we would love to have him in our school, um, you know, they were just they were just emotional and the father I just remember tears flowing down his face I think he was a bit surprised um, you know it was probably like going in and they maybe realized they had a 1 in 50 shot of the school actually taking him right, right. and uh, part of our school um, you know and I have to say this is coming from like the, the people who invest in the school and our CEO um, they've made a point of it being more than just making profit because private education is really t taking off in China and, and there's there's money to be made in it and they've basically said that they they're in it to make the money but they also want to be doing the right things and that's one reason why they'll take they'll take students um, with no tuition pay no tuition based on need and things like that and I think this was a case too where they thought this is the right thing to do in the situation is, is to let Johnny um, the boy into the school and the the only the one setback was as we were planning on him being in the school um, and he's eight years old they assumed because of his physical disability that he was going to be placed in a preschool class we had a preschool uh, th three pre preschool classes also at the time and Johnny was eight years old and they were gonna put it, they thought that it would be better to put him in with four-year-olds mm -hmm. and I, I I didn't um, respectfully I, I well, I appreciate your time today, and I do uh, actually have a gift for you, Greg. Um, you probably recognize this from in China, but it is a vase oh, uh, yeah. from yes. the Ming Dynasty. Yes, it is. So mm -hmm. um, it's very valuable. Please take yes. care of it. Yes, I'll uh, try, not to, try not to drop <laughs> this on the way out. It's um, it's definitely from from the Ming Dynasty. Yes. Yeah, ironically, it, it has some kind of even mm -hmm. futuristic Western writing. Yes, uh, it's it's got various. some. Like made in China. Yes, so that so we know uh, that it's authentic. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Um, well, I certainly appreciate your time today, and and uh, want to thank you for the opportunity to bring this experience back to our entire staff here at the at the Forest Area School District, and make them richer by understanding the experiences. Yeah.